Lisa. Uh, I am excited to talk to you today. I have a fairly um, discussion-based or, or plenty of room for question-based presentation, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my observations on how science has changed and how we could use new technologies and approaches to quickly move through this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm not quite sure all of the background that you all have, if you are virology experts and medical clinicians, or if you're coming just because you wanna hear a little bit more. So I tried to hit all of those levels, um, but please ask questions. It makes this so much more fun. And I really try to put an emphasis on the uh, NC State perspective and programs that we've built here to support it, um, which is largely robotic and technology based. So I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Um, I do have a few slides to show. It's mostly to guide my thoughts. So if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask them, put them in the chat. I think Melissa is going to watch for those and can let me know. Um, and there's only 10 or 12 slides and then I'll stop and we can take it wherever you would like to. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Perfect, thank you for the thumbs up. Um, okay, so I am an associate professor in the vet school. I am a microbiologist by training. I actually like bacteria more than I like viruses. So virus, <laughs> viruses got passed to me because of our current situation. And I oversee a lab that does the diagnostic work for uh, animals that come to the veterinary hospital. And we detect bacteria and viruses that are causing disease in, in the animals. So I've been at NC State for just over 10 years now, and I live out east of town uh, and have a farm with sheep and cows and horses and ducks and chickens and dogs and cats and three kids. So it's kind of a, a hairy ordeal out there. But um, I come, come here with a perspective on population level disease transmission. So when we do a lot of work in the veterinary field, we're really looking at big populations of animals most commonly. And that's a lot different than the usual approach humans take to diagnostics, which is how is this individual feeling and how are we gonna determine what the disease is for this individual and the treatment for this uh, individual. So this has been a really nice way to interact with human medicine because when we think about COVID and you've heard terms like herd health and um, populations and and all of that. It's, it's really applying a lot of the skills that we use in veterinary medicine to the human world and that's been pretty fun. So where I thought we would take today's conversation, unless you choose to take it someplace else, is to talk what, about what we know about COVID-19 and people. I'm going to give you just a little bit of an introduction into virology and, and SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID. And then I'm going to talk to you about testing. And if you remember early on in the pandemic, testing was really important and it was also really slow and cumbersome and hard to find. And we really used technology and equipment uh, well to improve that. And uh, an example that I'll give you is the NC State Surveillance Program that we now run through the College of Veterinary Medicine here, which tests between 10 and 12,000 NC State faculty, staff, and students a week. So from moving from a single individual test that was hard to find, we can now do 10 to 12,000 a week just on our own campus. Um, I also thought I'd just briefly mention vaccination. So one of the most common questions I get now is, do we even need to do this testing if we have good vaccination? So we'll talk a little bit about vaccination and, and what that herd immunity term means. And then if you watch the news, you've probably heard this term variants. So I thought I would introduce and show you what the variants uh, are doing in the United States and then what their effect is on testing and vaccination. So that's what we'll cover in people. And then I thought because I work at a, at a vet school and we diagnose SARS-CoV-2 infection in animals occasionally, that I'll introduce what, what it means for animals, who's affected, uh, how they're affected, and then how we're testing our animal patients as well. Okay, so 
I only have two really boring technical slides that my students would roll their eyes at, but I think they're important for some of the comments I'll make in, in a few minutes. So to start with a virus and uh, what is a virus, and that's different than bacteria or fungus or a lot of other germs that cause uh, people or animals to be sick. And one of the ways that it's different is that a virus is actually non-living. So it's simply a piece of genetic material, like you are made up of DNA that codes for you know, what your body's doing. That DNA is called a nucleic acid. And it's, so it's a piece of a genetic material like DNA, or in some cases, like SARS-CoV-2, it can be RNA, and it's just covered in protein. And it can't think for itself, and it doesn't respond particularly well to things because it's just a very simplistic piece of genetic material in that protein coat. And you may occasionally hear that protein coat called a capsid. So I just showed you a couple of different pictures of the different shapes and sizes of um, viruses over here on the right. And you can't see the genetic material, it would be inside, but you can then see most of these have a globe shape uh, that would enc encompass that genetic material, that's the capsid. And then they have these protrusions sticking out from them. And those are tails or spike proteins, depending on what the structure looks like. And those are what's really important for uh, helping the virus stick to a cell that it infects. So because it's non-living, the only way a virus can multiply is if it gets inside of living cells and hijack all of their nutrients and machinery in order to replicate. So a virus sitting on a table or on a handrail can't replicate. It's not growing in number. That's different than bacteria or fungus, which can continue to use proteins in uh, nutrients in the environment to continue to replicate. So viruses can't do that. And we talk a little bit about contact time and the risk of touching something and then contaminating. So it's not saying that they're being killed when they're not in a cell, only that they're not dividing and growing in number. And uh, viruses are very small. So they're 100 to 1,000 fold or times smaller than the cells that they infect. And just by happenstance, I was finding my kids, uh, going through my kids' toys today, and I found this little toy that they play with, and it's a perfect coronavirus. So I brought it in to show you that, which is this nucleic acid covered with this protein that makes a circle, and then it has these little fingers here, and those fingers are what go and find a host cell like in your nose and attach and allow the virus then to gain entry inside. And here is what the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. So the actual name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. So although we call it the COVID pandemic or uh, COVID-19, um, that's a disease associated with this virus, but the actual viral name is SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, a complicated thing, but it's actually tells you that it's related to SARS that we saw 20 years ago. And that CO there is for coronavirus. And coronavirus is the family or the type of virus that it is. And if I showed you that slide before, again, you saw that there's different shapes depending on the different family of virus. And this is what coronaviruses look like. And they all have RNA. And the RNA, the reason I tell you that is when we start to talk about the variants and how effective vaccines can be, the fact that it's RNA and not DNA is actually really important. So when DNA replicates in your human body, in my dog, in a bacteria, anything that has DNA, uh, it does a really good job of going back and checking itself to make sure that when it makes copies, it's the exact same as what it started with. And there are things like as you age and in some cancers and whatnot that we lose that mechanism of proofreading or checking that DNA. But for the most part, DNA does a really good job of checking and making sure it's accurate. RNA is really sloppy. So RNA will also need to be replicated or create a copy of itself so that a new viral particle can be formed but it does a really bad job of being like, hey, do I look exactly like that RNA that I started from? 
And so the reason we have these variants is because normally and naturally, as there is more viral replication, there is sloppy replication of that RNA, and then that leads to changes in the virus. So are there any questions on that that I can answer before we move on to these broader topics? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna move forward. But SARS-CoV-2 is uh, the virus, it's the infecting agent. And I put this on here, we could go through it. Um, it's not really important that you that you know this, but this is what our diagnostic tests that we use, our PCR or our antigen tests are based off of. So you can see these blue little appendages here. Those are the spike proteins. There's two types, S1 and S2. And that is what almost all of the vaccines are based on and what a lot of our um, diagnostic tests are based on. So the, the importance of these spike proteins is if the RNA changes and that spike protein changes, then our vaccines and our tests may or may not be effective in capturing new variants. Okay, we have this N um, nucleocapsid and we have genes or RNA segments that encode for that nucleocapsid that is also part of our diagnostic tests. And then you can see a membrane and an envelope there. So COVID-19 um, is an infectious disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So COVID is actually for the severe respiratory presentation. So you could have infection with the virus and not be sick, so you would not have COVID-19. So that's the distinction. And you will have heard that as asymptomatic people or people that tested positive but didn't know they had it. So when we talk about COVID-19, we're really referring to that clinical presentation of respiratory disease um, that's very severe. Otherwise, it's just sort of an infection with SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so um, pretty soon after we recognized the virus, there were tests developed so that we could detect this. And that part of technology and science in 2021 is really quite incredible to describe. So even if we go back to the previous SARS um, epidemic, and there was some cases in Canada, and it was a, a little bit more geographically limited, but when we had that virus, it took weeks to months to get that sequence to understand what it was that it was a new virus and, and what that viral shape and um, structure looked like. So fast forward to SARS-CoV-2 and people recognizing this in China in early 2019, that thing was sequenced so incredibly fast. So we knew more about the virus in a matter of days than with previous viruses than we would know in months to years. So part of the reason that we feel so optimistic about controlling the pandemic is all of the technology that allows us to understand exactly what the virus is and how it's changing in real time very quickly. So um, that even goes to this, the discussion about vaccines, which is new technology for vaccines, but how are we able to get a vaccine so quick? And that's because we could go through and use the technology to see what the nucleic acid said this virus was, and then find regions that were coding for those spike proteins and start to develop vaccines for them. So um, initially that led to development of different tests to detect SARS-CoV-2. And you've heard of a few different ones probably. The two common ones are antigen testing and PCR-based testing. So antigen is looking for the actual virus 
um, and it has to be alive and doing something, usually in nasal swabs. And these are often done on cards and they were done at places like Walgreens or Walmart where they could be done very quickly. And they were um, often ready in 15 minutes. And if you were shedding a lot of SARS-CoV-2 out of your nose, they were pretty darn effective at saying, yes, you are shedding a lot, go home and stay by yourself but they weren't very accurate. So there was, there's terms called sensitivity and specificity uh, associated with every test. So there is not a test that we use in microbiology worlds that is perfect and can detect every single case of an infectious agent and accurately say that that is what it is. So we have to balance the risk of having a false positive or a false negative. So antigen testing was very good, um, but occasionally you would have somebody have a positive antigen test, and then if they went in for a more sensitive PCR-based test, they would be negative. Um, and in the beginning of the pandemic, that was okay, because we would rather say you're positive, go home and quarantine, we'd rather call you negative than, than telling a bunch of people that they were negative and continuing to spread the virus in public settings. So antigen testing, very fast, very good at saying you're positive if you're shedding a lot of virus, just not particularly accurate. Uh, the preferred test is PCR-based testing, and I didn't go through what PCR was, but it's, it's what we use here at the NC State Lab, and um, it looks for the nucleic acid, so the genes, that those mRNA genes that are present in the virus. So the virus can be alive or dead or they're at high concentrations or they're at low concentrations. And the, the actual PCR technology amplifies those genes that are there to a point that we can visualize them or have our machines detect them. So you can have a lot less SARS-CoV-2 uh, present and still detect it with PCR than you could with antigen. So it has uh, a lot of advantages is still considered the gold standard, but it does take longer to do. So if we collected a, a nose swab from y'all today, we would bring it to the lab. We have to get the virus or the DNA or RNA rather, excuse me, the RNA uh, deactivated. And we have to put it through a series of processes in a machine that takes somewhere between three and four hours to do. So that's a lot slower than 15 minutes on a paper card of an antigen test. And the real challenge with PCR is it's, it's somewhat expensive. And so what labs need to do to make it cost effective to do it is they need to put a whole bunch of samples together on the, at the same time for it to uh, go through that process. So here at NC State, we currently run 376 different people samples at one time. Um, and until we get at least 200 in the lab, it's not financially worth it for us to run those samples. So some of the reason we had longer turnaround times was because of uh, the technology and, and how quickly we could accumulate samples in order to test them. Uh, it is more, spense, more expensive than antigen testing. I didn't put the specific numbers in here, um, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 um, to actually run a PCR-based assay. And the more samples you can put on at once, the cheaper it gets. Um, and of course, a lot of laboratories that developed this quickly were commercial or industry-based. And so they put a nice markup on after that. But it is the most accurate. The PCR-based assay that we use in our laboratory detects three different genes. So it de detects one of the spike proteins, some of the nucleic acid, and another gene on that mRNA. So if we find all three genes, we feel really good that, that the person's sample that we declared positive uh, was actually carrying SARS-CoV-2. And there's all sorts of um, other rules and sort of technicalities about that. As an example, the, the PCR that we use here requires that two of the three genes be tested. And I mention that because as we start to have new variants emerge, 
Um, and if the spike protein changes, it's really important that these assays are adapting to continue to detect SARS-CoV-2. And so we want to um, put in duplication or other, other targets. So if a spike protein changes and that's negative, we can still detect the other two gene targets and know that somebody has SARS-CoV-2. I saw, is there a chat that came in? Yes, we had a question. Do you still use the same nasal swab for PCR? Good question, yes. So um, initially at the very start of the pandemic, we were uh, recommending doing very deep nasal swabs. People often teared up and they were quite painful. Um, they were nasopharyngeal swabs. So those are going to be the most accurate because of where the virus attaches and starts to replicate. Uh, as we moved forward and understood the virus a little bit more, we found other ways that you could detect it as well. So, you, so at NC State now, we just swab the base of our nose. It's called the anterior nares. But there's other places that will do saliva-based tests uh, because saliva is highly predictive of you being positive. So I'm going to give you numbers and please don't hold me to them. They're not really accurate, but uh, it gives you an idea. So, so if you use those deep nasopharyngeal swabs and there was 100 people that were positive, we would detect 98 of them if we used PCR on a deep nasal swab. And if we moved to do the anterior nares or saliva, that turned into 94 or 95 people that we would detect out of those 100 that would be positive. So it was a little bit less uh, sensitive to do those, but it was a lot more tolerated by, by folks. And so we do use nasal swabs, but for our purposes, especially for surveillance, which I'll get into in just a few slides, we do a more convenient, less painful nasal swab. Did that answer your question, John? Okay. Okay. So one, um, comment I'd like to make, and it relates to how we choose to test on NC State versus how you may test if you're sick uh, and go to your doctor. And that is, there's a difference between doing testing for diagnosis, which is, I feel sick, I really want to know what I am sick with, versus surveillance testing. And that's that's what our Wolf Tracks lab at NC State is designed to do. So we offer all of these options. If you are sick and you go to student health, they can do a, a deep nasal swab and be pretty darn accurate in telling you if you're sick with SARS-CoV-2. But for surveillance testing, we're actually doing it for a different purpose. So we're really trying to find people that are either asymptomatic, which means they're carrying it, but they're not ill as a result of the virus, or pre-symptomatic, which means that they have the virus, but it hasn't been there long enough to actually give them any of the clinical effects or the, or the signs that make you feel yucky. And um, the reason that's important to us is because we know, and you've probably heard in the news, that a lot of the transmission of this virus occurs from people that never feel ill. So we want to know what that percentage is in our population so that we can identify clusters and track cases and we can make decisions on different types of activities based off of our current risk. And our real risk is not people that are sick because if you feel sick with uh, COVID-19, you're probably staying home. We feel like our real risk from a population NC State campus perspective is those people that are unknowingly taking and sharing the virus with other people. So um, for a diagnostic test, again, that's not something that we would put through the program I'm gonna to describe to you here in a minute. You would go to your doctor and they would do a very sophisticated test, usually PCR based still, and say, all right, you're sick, go home and quarantine or whatever your recommendations are. And what we're doing is saying, all right, healthy people, come and get tested so we know how many of you are accidentally bringing this to our campus so that we can get you uh, out of the population so you're not infecting other people. So in... December, maybe late November of 2020, 
NC State decided to invest in a laboratory that I direct here at the College of Veterinary Medicine, and we call it the Wolf Tracks Lab for uh, testing, reporting, and coronavirus surveillance or COVID surveillance. So that's what Wolf Tracks stands for. And it is a SARS CoV 2 surveillance screening for any NC State faculty, staff, or students. And it was part of a return to campus program that we put into place for the spring. As you probably know, in, in the fall, a lot of college campuses across the US decided that they couldn't safely bring people from other parts of the country back to campus and interact in large groups like we were used to doing. And even my, my children at home, who I've always had uh, enrolled in return to school programs, spent almost all of their fall at home doing virtual learning. So NC State was the same way. And I think for a variety of reasons that we could talk about, but it was quickly recognized that that wasn't the best college experience. And we really wanted to provide a way to get some faculty, staff, and students back to campus. So uh, we decided that testing was the way to move forward with doing that safely. And this is again, before there were real vaccine availabilities. So we built this when testing was really our best control mechanism to know who was shedding and who wasn't. And it was designed to detect those asymptomatic, which means not showing any signs or symptoms or pre-symptomatic individuals and determine our campus prevalence in order to assess risk. Uh, it was not intended to diagnose sick individuals and they would do that still through student health. So, November was a really last minute decision to try to build this on our campus. And we worked extremely hard over the holidays to renovate um, some laboratory space in the College of Veterinary Medicine and to order a almost $2 million robot that would allow us to have the capacity that we wanted to be able to offer this to all uh, faculty, staff and students. Um, so when we actually started with our return to campus program, we were using a commercial vendor. So just like you maybe went and drove up to a parking lot somewhere in uh, your community, for the first several weeks that NC State was open, we had people here do the same. And NC State um, and Wake County kind of paid for that and made it happen. So it wasn't charging them. Um, and it was quite expensive to the university for those contracts that made that happen. And so at, in, at the same time, we were working in the background to build our own laboratory that could manage that. And um, I'd be happy to get into the specifics or the decision-making process of that, but uh, it required some facilities renovation. It required a, a semi-truck trailer with a giant robot on it to, to be delivered to NC State. We had to hire people that could work in the laboratory. But all in all, we saw that as a really useful investment for the university. So testing um, for ourselves was approximately one third the cost of a commercial test. So I told you before that it costs around $30 to run a PCR based test. And most of the commercial vendors that we were contracting with at the time were charging somewhere around $100 per test. So even though it was a significant investment to renovate the facilities and purchase the equipment, um, we calculated that by the time we did 130,000 tests, it would pay for itself. The whole program would pay for itself. And uh, we've already exceeded that as we started testing February 19th and we started with about 12,000 um, collections per week. So the capacity is right around 12,000 samples per week. It's not machine or robot limited, it's staff limited. We could run um, probably about 16 to 18,000 a week if we had to hire additional staff. I currently run two shifts. So somebody comes in at eight and we have people here until 11 to get that done. And those to get the 10 to 12,000 done rather. And those numbers stayed really consistent from the end of January through April, 2020. And now as prevalence has declined and, and the campus community has started to go home for the summer, um, 
we're somewhere less than 10,000 a week, but we're still offering this throughout the summer to any NC State faculty, staff, or student that's on site. Any questions on that? Okay. So um, a question that I get a lot is, well, what are you gonna do with this equipment when we don't have COVID problems anymore? And the beauty about the robot that we bought is there is one step where we put one tiny bottle of reagent into the equipment that says, okay, I'm gonna go look for SARS-CoV-2 specifically. But the rest of the, of the program and the process and the equipment can be used for surveillance activities of any infectious disease that we wanted. So right now the plan is to support all SARS-CoV-2 surveillance activities for as long as NC State needs. And to the best of my knowledge, I think we're planning on some surveillance activities through the fall semester. So we're gonna keep doing it sort of required and mandatory for employees probably for most of the summer. And I think how and what we decide to test through the fall has yet to be determined, but there will be some form of testing for people that are on NC State's campus. Um, but the automated robotic equipment is easily repurposed. I apologize, I forgot that, uh, <laughs> that finished that sentence, high throughput detection of any other uh, infectious disease as possible. And we're currently working with the vendor that provided us the robot um, to figure out how we want to move forward. But we could do on-campus flu testing. Uh, we could prepare for the next pandemic. What I really envision in the immediate future is working with um, animal industry here in North Carolina because we're in the vet school to provide some sort of population high throughput um, infectious disease testing for the, that population. Have any other universities done this? So there are other universities that have done this and we talked to several of them to, to hear how they did it and why they did it. Um, UNC is doing it, Duke is doing some on-site surveillance testing as well. It's somewhat sporadic, but I think there's a, a large number of universities that have done some form of surveillance in order to get students back. What's different about our lab is um, the robotic equipment that we chose to use and it made it extremely high throughput and efficient and, and cost effective to do that, but it was a large upfront bill. Um, the other thing, and, and I'm sure you know about this if you've bought toilet paper or bleach or hand sanitizer, but the um, supply chain is extremely unpredictable right now. And so one of the reasons we went with this contract and this equipment is because they would guarantee that we would have all of the equipment that we needed to run all the tests we needed. And where a lot of other universities struggled is if they chose to do it more manual or without this big um, robotic piece, then the predictability of having all their supplies has been extremely frustrating and difficult. And we even see that in our other clinical labs. So I don't know if anybody knows what a pipette is, but a pipette is a very common tool used in a laboratory that allows you to suck up fluid. And the little tips that you have to use for that have been back ordered for months and months and months. And so just the plastic supply chain itself um, has almost made the whole system pay for itself. All right, I'm gonna transition from testing to just a little bit about vaccination. And I took these exact um, images on the left from the CDC website. And there's obviously lots of politics and controversy surrounding CDC. So I, I'm not gonna get into what they have, but they do have some nice resources for uh, tips and tricks and um, science-based information that you can find. So in the US, we're currently using three vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, Moderna and Pfizer are very similar. They um, came to market about the same time. I actually should have probably listed Pfizer first. It came to market a little bit faster. Uh, both of those are two-dose vaccines. 
and they really target those spike proteins. And so part of the reason when we talk about variants that that we don't know what vaccination will look like going forward is as we continue to get variants and mutations in those spike proteins, uh, we don't know how much coverage we will continue to get from the current vaccine. And that's no different from the flu. So when you talk about getting your annual flu shot, the reason we need to do that is because the flu is constantly changing. And so what happens every year for the flu vaccine is that they look usually in Australia and New Zealand and they see what strains are most common down there and they try to make a flu vaccine that covers those most common strains. And then that's what they administer to people here so that as the flu uh, predictably um, comes through our uh, population, we would have had some protection. And as, as you all know, sometimes they get it right and we have really good protection and sometimes they guessed wrong and we don't get very good coverage. But because the flu is always changing, we have to constantly get flu vaccines. And the same thing might be the case for COVID. We're just a little bit too early into it to know that. Um, but as we talk about testing and continuing to control the spread of the virus, the more we can control the spread, the less variants we're going to get and the more likely that our vaccines will work for longer. So there is a component of continuing to monitor um, the virus that's important for vaccination as well. Um, so Pfizer and Moderna are both two shots. Um, that is classic immunology 101 that if you went through a biological science program, you may know. But what happens after an initial shot is that you get an antibody response. So your body develops some protection. And then when you get a second shot at three to four weeks, it's like hyperprotection because your body's already coming off seeing that initially and then it got reintroduced to the to the virus and so you get much more effective immunity uh, after you get the second shot. So both of those are the, are uh, good products and they have something like 96 to 98 percent efficacy in preventing severe COVID infection. So it doesn't necessarily prevent all infection. We do know that it reduces transmission and it reduces the likelihood you're gonna get it. But really what it's designed to do is to prevent severe COVID. And then the Johnson & Johnson was a single shot, um, which is also a very good product. So it's efficacy because it's only a single shot is uh, reported to be a little bit less, but it's not because it's not a good product. It's just um, a single, single shot. And when we talk about herd immunity or our desire to get our total population um, to a level of protection where the virus doesn't have enough people that it can infect, that it can continue to spread, uh, efficacy of 66% or whatever Johnson & Johnson currently is, is particularly or is um, high enough that it contributes to herd immunity and still an important uh, contributing vaccine tool. Um, what else about vaccines? Last night, my 12-year-old daughter just got her first Pfizer dose. So that's been the most recent um, vaccine to have an age adjustment as they get more clinical studies done that show the effectiveness. They continue to adjust the age that can receive the doses. So there are people out there in the community that are volunteering to get these vaccines uh, at different ages that aren't necessarily approved so that we can get enough scientific data to know uh, how we can adjust those labels. Any questions on vaccine? John, are you typing one? Okay, I'll wait for it then. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Um, if you're fully vaccinated, can you still carry, I know that you can, um, could you still carry the disease and test positive? Mm. Good question. So there's two pieces to that. Um, you can carry the disease if you're fully vaccinated. We don't think that you carry near as much of it, and we don't think that it's really like a healthy enough virus to go and infect other people as well. Um, and you can test positive. 
What we think is happening with most people that are fully vaccinated and testing positive right now is something called breakthrough infection, which is probably caused by a variant um, that is overcoming that vaccination. It doesn't mean it's making people sick, but it means that they are more effective variants at colonizing and um, and making people positive. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let me see what John's question is. One second. Is the vaccine the same for all ages thus far? It is actually. It is the exact same vaccine. And the reason why the ages are changing is just how many people are enrolled and, and they decided to target the, the highest at-risk populations early on. And so more people were, were enrolled at that age, but the vaccine hasn't changed like for my 12 year old that got it last night. Good question. Okay, um, so what are these variants that we keep talking about? So they're viruses virus sequences with similar genetic content. So their mRNA is or their RNA is pretty much the same, but it's not identical. And that when that RNA changes, there's sometimes that it changes and there's no effect to the virus. Or there's sometimes that it changes and it actually makes the virus proteins change or those little appendages on the outside. And some of those Proteins have made these viruses more infectious, so more likely to be transmitted and, and it requires less to actually establish an infection. And sometimes it changes the protein and makes the virus not active at all. So, so the ones that we hear about are the variants that are changing, that are making the virus um, more infectious or more virulent, which means like more likely to cause symptoms. But it's, it's having other effects on the virus all the time. And I just put this slide up here. It came from the CDC as well. And it just shows in different colors the percent of different variants that we get out of diagnostic samples. So the other reason we want people to test is because then we can get information on what the virus is doing over time. Uh, and so all of our positives here we put into a freezer and we have researchers that use them or we have uh, the state public health lab that'll reach out because they wanna know what's going on uh, with the type of virus that we're seeing. And if you look on this chart here, you can see that the B12 variant in January represented roughly 40% of the virus that we found in the community, and now it's less than one. But now we're seeing this B117 be the predominant member uh, or variant that's being spread in the community. So although they're all still SARS-CoV-2, they're all a little bit different and it can change the virus property. We've seen that at NC State as well. So one of the ways that we can, we can't determine the variant by PCR. You actually have to submit that and sequence and uh, get the exact nucleotide sequence uh, of the virus. But we can look at what um, the genes that we are able to detect are doing. And we saw that in February, we had about 20 to 30% that were variants. And now we're up over 70% of the positive samples that we get through our surveillance laboratory are variant strains and most likely this B117 as well. So when you hear in the news that they have names, um, the Texas variant or the Indian variant or the Brazilian variant or the UK variant, that's where these variants were initially discovered. And sometimes like, especially with the UK variant, we don't know exactly the moment or the person that this virus changed in. It is a combination of having a test where we are getting these sequences and doing enough testing that we can um, assign what that virus's behavior is to a population. Okay, so a few comments, um, and I'll leave some time for discussion here. A few comments on COVID-19 in animals. So actually, before we ever even thought about testing for uh, NC State people at the vet school, we established PCR protocols. They weren't high throughput. They were much more of the classic uh, start of the pandemic individual reactions, but we established those to look for SARS-CoV-2 in animals. And our concern 
wasn't really that we were going to have um, transmission back to people. However, anytime you ask people to work with animals or people that are sick, we want to make sure we can provide the most protection that we can. And so we knew that people had the potential to transmit this virus to animals. And we wanted to make sure that when animals with respiratory signs came into our hospital, they weren't going to be a risk to other animals or to people. So we tested um, animals if they came from a house from a person that had COVID and they demonstrated respiratory disease. And those requirements were really supported for the US by the USDA um, group. So they don't want us to go hunting for SARS-CoV-2 in animals because we don't feel like animals are an important component of the cycle. However, there are some animals that can more easily get SARS-CoV-2 or be infected and develop respiratory signs. Cats in particular, you may have heard in the news about tigers and lions and even some house cats. Um, and as we did more research, there's a few more animal species as well. And mink is a big one. Mink are very highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 and then have been demonstrated to be able to give it back to people. And that's different than most animals who we know can get SARS-CoV-2, may develop signs, but can't transmit it back to humans. Um, we actually had a dog that came to NC State with respiratory distress or disease. So he came here and very quickly died. Uh, and when we did his nasal swabs, he tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. He also uh, developed a, a systemic or a septic infection. So he had E. coli in his lungs as well. And we really still don't understand if the SARS-CoV-2 was related to his pneumonia with E. coli or it was just an incidental finding. His owners had previously tested positive two weeks prior um, to the dog coming in and testing positive. So dogs can be infected, but what we really want people to know is they are incidental. It's not common that they are infected. And when they are, there is no evidence that they are transmitting it back to people. And that was really important messaging because we don't want people to make uh, negative decisions about how they handle and interact and the livelihood of their dogs if they are not risks. So we are a risk to our pets, but our pets really aren't a risk back to us. Um, and minks are kind of the, the exception to that. And it ended up being fairly devastating for that industry because they had several farms where they had to euthanize a lot of animals. So they do seem to show clinical signs. They seem to show coughing and high fever, which is very similar to people, um, but not all of the dogs that are or cats that we know that have been infected or tested positive do develop clinical signs. So it seems to reflect somewhat what we see in humans. Um, so we've really backed down on testing in animals now, uh, but certainly if we had an animal come in from a recently positive house, with respiratory disease, we would put them in our isolation unit. We would wear all of the personal protective equipment that you would see in a human ICU hospital and manage that um, risk just because it's not worth the chance that um, we have a situation where it could be reverse transmitted back. So that is kind of what I prepared. Melissa, do we... Is that, am I good on time or did I talk too much? Oh no, you're great on time. Okay, sounds good. So I would be happy to try to answer any questions or take any feedback if you have it. This is Jimmy Cook. I, I don't have a question, uh, doctor, but I, I do very much appreciate the information you shared this morning. Uh, uh, didn't really realize that NC State was uh, uh, doing as much as they were on that. So th thank you for providing this to us. Ah, thank you for that. Yes, um, I think like most colleges, they really struggled with the financial investment and not and the uncertainty of what the pandemic looked like. So although I made it seem like we're sort of recent to the game, people have been thinking about it for a, for a long time. 
They're actually, and I didn't talk about this too, they actually have vaccine clinics here on site as well. So student health had other efforts in getting freezers and getting vaccines delivered. So before the general public had as much access as they do, um, they were able to vaccinate on site as well. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you first for a, a very interesting presentation. I, I actually learned a lot. <laughs> Good, I'm about glad. Viruses and COVID-19. <laughs> uh, I was struck by the, the change in the, the dominant from B.1.2 to B.1.17. Yes, that's uh, right. Over like a four or five month period. But are we still seeing that the current vaccine is effective at that same rate, even though that has changed so dramatically? Yeah, that's a good question. And it is that UK variant that you might have heard about before. And the vaccine does seem to cover that. So the UK variant is much more contagious. We know that. It doesn't necessarily seem to be associated with a lot more uh, disease, but the vaccine does seem to be effective against that. Thank you. And, um, I, I don't want this to be a negative comment, so I'm going to try to figure out how to phrase it. But honestly, the positives that we're seeing on campus are usually a younger population that doesn't want to be vaccinated. So we've only had four cases, I think, of people that had any vaccine that they had subsequently tested positive. Any more questions before we wrap up? Right. I did have one other question. Um, it, this is just, um, I guess, a personal opinion. Do, do we have some sense of how much of our US population will not likely get vaccinated for whatever reasons? Well, I am from the great state of Wyoming, and I can tell you that in Wyoming, vaccine compliance is highly different <laughs> than it is in North Carolina or, or in other states. I think right now um, we estimate that it's at 56%. Um, really, to have good herd immunity, we probably need to be somewhere between 60 and 70. And with the number of variants that it might be a little bit too late to get really good herd immunity, but it's highly geographic. And from a person who looks at data all, all of the time, I think that's been a really interesting challenge of this pandemic is how much sort of politics and regional geography has affected the scientific response. But I think, I think we're hoping for 60%. But at the vet school, I can tell you we're at 98%. So it just is population specific. Thank you. Yeah, and the other thing I'm just gonna mention quickly is if you have not heard, um, COVID is ravaging India right now in ways that we cannot understand in the United States. And I think that that's always our risk too, is we, we feel like we have a good understanding or control within the United States and we're loosening restrictions and all of that, which is all very positive. But if we cannot help other countries control this, if you have 300,000 cases a day, we are gonna get many, many, many more variants. So not only is there the sort of human mm, decency sort of component that I feel about, but it can continue to be a problem for US public health if we can't help control this in other places because we're gonna get more introduction of variants. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we've come to the end of our program. We'll be emailing out the recording for all of our reunion programs in case you want to check it out later or you want to check out any of the ones that were also happening at the same time. Um, as we start to plan for a return to, to in-person alumni gatherings, the Alumni Association will continue to provide some virtual programming going forward. Um, we found that this has been really useful and wonderful and that these programs were not bound by geography, so that's been really great. And we can have them and watch them later if we want. So we have a full list of our programs on our website that we've already done in the past year. Um, so keep an eye out on our website for those and your email for future upcoming events. And we thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to Dr. Jacob. This was super interesting. I was glad I got to participate in this one because it's just such a relevant topic right now. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. It was nice talking to y'all. Yeah.
Thanks everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your day.